Uh, now I would like to introduce our uh, honored guest tonight, Sheikh Yasser Qadi. Many of you may have had a chance to hear him last night, actually. Um, after Salat al-Tarawih, he gave a very inspirational lecture. And it's actually available online at masjidumar.com. And this is a great way actually to stay in touch uh, with the masjid and all of our activities. At masjidumar.com, you can stay up to date. Alhamdulillah, there are many committees and many devoted brothers and sisters who are constantly planning activities uh, throughout the week and throughout the year that can benefit all of us. Uh, Sheikh Yasir Qadi was actually born in Houston, Texas. Uh, he got a degree in chemical engineering from the University of Houston. And then he went overseas and he studied in Al Medina. He memorized the Quran by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was able to get his bachelor's from the College of Hadith and Islamic Sciences. He went on to get his master's degree in Islamic theology from the College of Dawah. And he is currently pursuing his PhD in Connecticut at Yale University. So without further ado, I welcome Sheikh Yasser Qadi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawala. Amma ba'd. A number of years ago, I got a phone call from an American lady who said that she was interested in, in attending any Islamic classes for herself and her daughter. And so I told her that I have a certain, you know, had a certain dance in the masjid. Why don't you come? We can talk about Islam uh, after the class. So she came, and she was perhaps in her mid or late thirties, and she had a, a young daughter with her, and she was absolutely American. I thought she was a Caucasian American. So I began to ask her, how did you hear about Islam, and, and you know, what do you, what did you know about Islam? She said, no, no, I'm a Muslim. I said, oh, mashallah, when did you convert? She said, no, I was born a Muslim. I just looked at her because she looked absolutely Caucasian to me. And she said, oh actually, uh, I am an Arab American who has been here for four generations. And our, our family is from Detroit. Most of you know that in uh, Detroit, there was a mass exodus of Arabs around 1900, 1870 to 1910. A huge exodus. And my great grandfather uh, came here from, from Lebanon. And so I was born a Muslim, but Really, I've never practiced Islam, and I've gone through a really bad divorce now, and I have a, a girl with me, and I want her to know about Islam. So I was very intrigued. This was the first time I had met a fourth generation American Muslim. I myself am second generation, and that's a very big thing, that most second generation Muslims are still in their you know, early teens and whatnot. So it's very rare to be the third or fourth generation. So I was very intrigued, and I got asking her about her biography, her family's history, and subhanAllah, so many things to really talk about, but the one thing that struck me, and it really and truly made me in a way frightened, this sister of mine had no idea what Islam was. She didn't even know the Fatiha. She didn't know how to pray. She didn't know even the basic rulings of Islam. She had memorized the Kalimah, Alhamdulillah. She knew La ilaha illallah. Alhamdulillah, I mean it, Alhamdulillah. She knew La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Apart from that, absolutely nothing. And she had lived her entire life knowing that she's a Muslim, but not even knowing one thing beyond that. And the only reason that she was coming back to Islam now was because she had been through a very tough divorce and she has a young daughter with her and she wants to now, basically it's a time of crisis and at times of crises, man by his nature goes back to Allah. Allah says in the Quran, anytime some evil touches you, you turn to Allah. Any musibah happens, you remember Allah. And when Allah solves the musibah, you forget Him. When Allah takes care of your problems, you turn away. So she was going through a crisis like this. But what scared me, as I said, was the fact that in just three or four generations, she had no idea what her own religion and identity was. And it was a blessing of Hamdan that she came back to Islam. But for every one of her, how many in her place are not returning? For every one of his sister who had come to me, how many of her siblings, how many of her friends, how many of our own descendants, three, four generations down, will not be returning to the Messiah? And so, Really, the talk today, even though we can talk a long time about it, we only have a few minutes. The talk today is about establishing a vision for Muslims in North America. What exactly are we supposed to do? 
What are we going to do? Are we the first time that there's been a minority of Muslims in a non-Muslim land? No. There have been many other minorities that have existed in non-Muslim lands. The most important ones traditionally are the minorities of India and of China. There have always been Muslims in India since the time of the Companions and even in China. But there was one major difference between us and them. And this difference is a profound difference. The difference is that the Muslims of India were Indian Muslims. The Muslims of China were Chinese Muslims. Later on, Muslims accept, people accepted Islam in Indonesia. They were Indonesian Muslims. In other words, culturally, Islam became a part of the fabric of India, part of the fabric of China, part of the fabric of Indonesia. And the people who accepted it were Indian, Chinese, Indonesian. The difference is in America, the majority of us are not from here. Ethnically, we are not quote-unquote American, if there is something called American, because all America is composed of immigrants. But still, there is a mainstream America. And most of us have immigrated into this country, 60s, 70s, 80s, immigration is still going on. We are now having our children here, second generation is being born, and I'm a product of that second generation. And so we are a mixture of cultures. We still speak a little bit of Arabic or Urdu, we have a cuisine attached to us, we have a lot of, 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 of if you like, um, remnants attached to our culture, and we also have aspects of American culture within us. But still, we are not fully American, because we're considered to be from a different ethnicity and a different religion. The same thing has happened in other countries as well. Argentina, Brazil, Mexico. Many of you are probably unaware that there was a mass exodus of Muslims to South America. The same time that those Arabs came to Detroit in the turn of the century, a lot of them also went to South America. These days, there are no remnants of those Muslims. None. There are no massages of their descendants in Brazil and Argentina. Yes, there are massages of modern Arab and Pakistani immigrants, just like you have in America. But those immigrants that came, Less than a hundred years ago, there is no trace of them. There is a slight trace, yes. The current president of Argentina is a descendant of one of those Muslims. Yes, he is a descendant of one of those Muslims. It's an open fact, he's not even denying, it's not as if there's some conspiracy. One of his great-grandparents, his great-grandfather, immigrated as an Arab Muslim. Of course, he is a practicing Christian. Such a practicing Christian that he was openly elected to the president of Argentina and there was no qualms, no issues that his ancestry was Muslim. These points, brothers and sisters, underscore the problems that we need to think about. 